Hello and welcome back to another episode of the For the Property Investor podcast. And we have a uh, another episode in our expert series today. And, and for this first time, uh, or at least the first time in a long time, I can't remember, uh, we have a conveyancer on. So, um, and that is Judy Hogarth. So welcome, Judy. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited. Yes. No, it's great to have this conversation. We have conversations all the time about what's happening in um, in the market and with buyers and sellers and so on. Um, and uh, so I thought, well, let, let's jump on the podcast and hit record and, and have this conversation, try and provide some value to everyone else out there. Um, but uh, before we get into the nitty gritty, tell us a bit about yourself, how you got started and 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 why you're doing conveyancing. Okay. Well, how I fell into conveyancing is I, when I was 19 or 20 thereabouts, I started my first job in a law firm as a paralegal. Right. And I was working there for a while and I thought I'm going to get into law. This sounds like you know something that I would really really like to do and my boss at the time was um what a gentleman um he'd be he was a sole practitioner and he did a little bit of everything so it was a general practice law firm and he always just seemed really grumpy um (laughs) you know he'd he'd go to court and then he'd come back from court and if he had a good time like if if something went well at court then he would like hop up the stairs and you could you could tell it was going to be a good afternoon but if he if he didn't go well at court you know he'd hear him thumping up these stairs and um I thought oh I'm not sure that those areas of law are are for me and there was a licensed conveyancer in another room and she worked there too. And one day I went into her room um, to file some documents, h- hiding from my boss because he was in a bad mood because something bad had happened at court <laughs> and he was in a bad mood. So I was kind of like, oh, I'll go file in, the, file in the room. So I'm filing away these documents. And I heard her make this call to clients. And she said, congratulations, it's settled. You're homeowners. You know, how do you feel? Like, what's this? And, and the clients were so ecstatic. Yeah. And I just remembered the sound in their voice and I thought, what, what, what is this? What is this? <laughs> Conve- what is conveyancing? Because it, in other areas of law, there's really no winners or losers. You know, there's, there's just a, no one's really happy. Even if you win, you might have lost money. You have to go through the stress of court. But in conveyancing, it was like. The, it's it's just a solicitor's bank account that wins. Really. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> um, and in conveyancing, you've got, you've got some happy clients at the end, like whether they're selling or purchasing. And yeah. That really appealed to me. And so I sat down and I said, her, her name was Jen. And I said, what is conveyancing? Tell me everything. And that's how I found it. So I kind of like went, I, I went into law thinking I'm going to be a lawyer and then found conveyancing. And then it opened up. Um, I, I then did my the, the course at, at Macquarie University, got my license and then went and worked in a um, conveyancing office. And found myself uh, back in a law firm, but I love uh, the hustle of conveyancing. It's very, it's deadline based. It's task yes. management based. Um, believe if you it or want not, that adrenaline I'm, rush. The adrenaline rush. That's what I love. I love the <laughs> adrenaline rush. So, you know, you've got to meet. If you miss your one task, you've got to meet that deadline. You've got to. There's obligations in each contract that you have to meet certain time periods for. Um, miss one of those and like things can go wrong and uh, my brain is just wired to love that rush so yes we have you know our entire office is like set up so we can control all the chaos yeah. and, in a really calm and professional way but um, all my team actually we're, we're a little bit general and junkies in that sense like we do love that <laughs> rush of you know what's going to happen now and can we do this and get let's get this over the line so that's how I found my way in and I ha- it's all I've ever done. I've only ever done conveyancing. I've not worked wow. in any other career. So yeah. over 20 years, what I have been able to navigate my clients through all different experiences, there's pretty much no situation that I have not experienced 
to know how it's going to end out or how to navigate through it or how to stop my clients from from getting to that point. Yeah. Uh, I've seen pretty much almost everything. <laughs> and how did you go from working in a practice to then being self-employed and starting yeah. your own business? That was almost a natural transition. So I worked in a law firm for 12 years for um, a lawyer and her uh, Karen Hager and Associates and uh, her, she sold, she retired and then sold her practice. And so on sale, she said, um, you know, are you, would you like to stay here or would you like to go? Are you going with the, the business sale? And at that point, um, because at no time in did in my life did I ever think that I would own my own business. Right. So it was not something that I had ever thought that I would do. And I had a really good group of um, referral partners, a really good network yeah. of business like-minded community. Um, and they said to me, they encouraged me, so, so you could actually yeah. do this on your own. This is something that you're quite capable of doing. So at that point, I said to um, my boss at the time, yeah, I, I think I will actually go out on my own. Do you think I could do that? And she goes, yes. Actually, I think you're quite capable yeah. of running your own practice. That's something that well, I think you could do. If we can back up just a little bit, what what um, what was your train of thought with um, – the, the fact that you had in your mind or uh, that you never thought you would be in business for yourself and and, and how did you go about transitioning? Because there's a lot of people out there who uh, are good at what they do and, yes, they either don't think that they could run their own business um, or some people think that they can and, and um and or they want to, but um, they're not sure how to go about it. But um, why had you never thought about um, being able to do it for yourself? I guess it was that false sense of security that I had. Yeah. Where you're employed, you get that wage every month. Yeah. And that's some sort of false sense of security, I guess. Yeah. Okay. And it was just taking that major leap off to realize that I, I had been doing it and I think that's what my my boss at the time or mentor had kind of bestowed this knowledge is that you've been doing it for the past 12 years you just yeah. haven't realized it um it is something that you only have to learn how to do the rest of the the, the business side of things but you've grown a business whether you realize mm. that or not but I've grown that conveyancing arm of the business so um, I thought, oh, okay, if I, I kind of, like, yeah, dawned on me that I had done that. And so all I had to do was again for myself. I think. So that's what gave you the confidence when it was pointed out that you had really been doing it for yourself? I've been doing it, essentially. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, essentially had been doing it for myself, yeah. Cool. And, and um, obviously was it, it I, I mean, was it, did you become natural to you as soon as you started? Or did it still take you a while to get used to being in business for yourself? Well, I got a coach straight away. Okay. So I had a mindset and I had some help on how to kind of launch and 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 how that, that looks, how a brand new business wins in the first three months, six months, 12 months, how that looks and feels and yeah. whether it was normal. So, But I think my biggest transition has really just happened now. Where because I was growing, I was working, I was still working in the business, doing the conveyancing work. And I I feel like now I more work on the business. Yeah. A lot more. And I'm not doing the everyday tasks. And how long has this been since you've been in business? Uh it's two just over two years. Okay. Yeah. Now. So I think on the first of June we had our first birthday a second birthday yeah um this year so it's just yeah you know, august so just over um two years and it, it's really been that transition between okay here's the set of task lists that we do every day that i run our entire office runs off and then i'm not doing any of that now like i'm doing contract reviews and i do front house stuff and i clients speak yeah. to me all the time yeah and 
and as far as the outside, I guess a client would see is that I am still heavily involved because mm. I am. But for myself and my, my mental state, ticking those boxes and hearing that ding, ding after you've done a task, <laughs> it makes me feel like I've had purpose that day. And it does, I know that sounds, might sound a little bit like, I don't know, nerdy, but, and I, and I think the transition has just happened where it's like, I went, well, what am I doing every day? What am I doing during the day? Like, I feel like I'm not achieving things. I'm not ticking these tasks. I'm not, I'm not doing anything. And then it's just occurred to me that this is now my role. My yeah. role is to be there for my team, to yeah. support them, to encourage them, um, to be there for the clients, to, you know, support and, and assist them and navigate them through their dealings. And that is my role now. So my role is gone from ticking those boxes and hearing that ding to speaking with the clients and hearing and hearing them and you know hearing my team be satisfied and now that's what fulfilling me that's it's a different type and, of and that's a true yeah and, and that's a, a a real um it's a a true representation of leadership in business where the the owner or the manager um the boss in to use a generic term is really they're working for the team it's not the other way around it isn't it really isn't and um and, and that's something that's hard for a lot of people to for a lot of bosses to get their head around um yeah their job is to be a leader for the team which means that they're working for the team and and providing them with all of the tools um and not just physical tools, but it's the mental and emotional tools as well. It really to is. To be able to get through the day and do a good job and enjoy themselves and be glad to be turning up every day. Absolutely. We're big on, I am really big on work-life balance. Yeah. And um, my team are, well, I should say not all of them, most of them are mums. And yeah. we understand the work-life balance and we understand being a wife, being a mother and, and, and working. And so I'm really big on making sure that not just myself, but my team also have that so that they are not stressed, that they are, you know, not overloaded, um, that we have systems that if you need the time, you can take the time uh, if that's necessary. So it's, it is really about supporting and encouraging them and also further development. So, you know, I, I have a team member that said, you know, she would like to do more. So I'm like, okay, let's, let's do that. Like, what does that look like? What does that look like for my business? How do I make that work? How do I support her in mm. her further growth and development in the conveyancing space? Uh, how do I support that? Yeah. And, and I, I believe that that's what's helping us be more of a really close-knit team because mm. we truly are all there not just work to support each other through work but support each other through being um family because all our kids are around the same age as well yeah. so it's like we walk in the door and it's like what type of morning did you have <laughs> how was your morning were you a screaming mess because i was or um you know she might have a great morning or i might have a great morning and we're like okay and then we kind of like spend that time counseling each other through it and then we're like right get stuck back into the day yes. and i think that then um, kind of goes through to our clients as well because we understand that our clients that is their that's their life as well they have lives they have kids they have jobs yeah and, and what we're doing is uh, just a small little essence in their otherwise life like it's one one season or you know six weeks that we're going to be involved in their life and so the way that we interact with our clients is very much in a supportive and assistant way as well you know we're not yeah. here to make your life um, hard. We're going to help and, and answer your questions. Um, we're going to try to make the process as easy as we can mm. because we understand where we fit in your life. We're, we're not mm. coming in and being like, we're all important. We are assisting you achieve your property goals. And how, yeah. do, how what does that look like for you? And each client that's different. You know, some clients like to come into the office. That's okay. Other clients are um, overseas or they're working in the city and they're you know, through Zoom. So whatever that looks like for our clients, that's that's how we operate. Breaking the mold of the old grumpy lawyer that does um, that you go to to um, buy a property. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants an old grumpy lawyer? You yeah. don't. You want to, you want to get off the phone. You want to feel a little bit a little bit more um if nothing else more insight. Like you want to feel informed. Yes. So if I can't inspire or encourage the clients if it, if it's a bit of a heavy conversation because you can understand amazing isn't all roses. There are some yeah. times when situations can get um, a little heavy. And if anything else, when the client gets off the phone, they may not feel too happy, uh, but I, at least they feel informed. Like I feel like I, yes. I, it's a supportive environment where they can ring up and let me know what's going on. They can feel supported and informed in the situation because there are situations that are entirely out of their control. You know, you've got the other side, you've got a lot of other moving parts that we can't control. And as much as you try, you might just have someone on the other side who is just a bit of a wall. And yeah. at least the clients, our clients can feel supported through that. Yes. So in short, you, you help um, your clients buy and sell uh, any property within New South Wales, correct? Yes. yes. Whether it be commercial, it doesn't really uh, matter what it is. As long as it's got a title on it, you can help them with the legal process of buying and selling. That's and it. reviewing the contracts and so on. Um, so have you got a couple of stories that you can give us of um, interesting stories of things that um, uh, might have been went well or things that went wrong or, or maybe just an interesting story of, of, you know, what people could be aware of as a result? Yes, absolutely. So when we are purchasing property yeah yeah okay um actually no can i do a sale i yeah, actually, have, sure. I actually yeah. have one where um it's a it's a vendor disclosure topic okay all right so we were actually acting for the vendor so for the person that was selling the property and we'd done up the contract and and now we have a very um detailed as you can imagine a very detailed instruction form that we get clients to fill out and the client had filled this out and we had prepared the contract in accordance with that and the contract the property went to auction sold at auction it was over three million dollar property and closer to settlement about mid transaction i received an email from the purchasers solicitors that was very spe uh, specific in its questioning. And initially I read it and I went, they know something I don't. <laughs> and I gave it to the clients and it was asking about building works. Right. Really specific building works. And my client was instructing us on how to answer on the way. And I was answering back what my client was instructing me and then they would write back something else even more specific and I went they definitely know something that I don't know my client's not telling me yeah and so I said to the client look at this stage are you sure that there is nothing they're pretty specific questions about you know building work are you sure there's nothing that I should know this isn't an area of law where if you don't tell me you know, some like criminal law, if you, if you did something, if, you, if you're guilty and you go tell your lawyer you're guilty, but you want to plead innocent, well, they can't do that. Like it's, yeah. it's it, a property law, conveyancing is very different. It's not that area. Like if you told me that you have unapproved works, I put it in the contract that protects you. Yeah. Right. Um, and it went on for a while and it got to the point where I, I had to really firmly but really politely say I, I feel like I'm not getting everything and it's only this is only going to get worse for you until you tell me exactly what the situation was and the client said well the whole second story of the property has been built without approval wow and it was a, it was a just it originally was like a just a three little three bedroom little cottage and they turned it into quite a big dwelling so when I looked at the property I was like oh, oh my. <laughs> my goodness and I was like okay and 
and, and why am like I didn't. Why am I only finding out now? I know, and it, it didn't go like that. Like that's obviously not how the questioning went. But I, I had to try to get there. Like why? Why? Why didn't you tell me this back at the beginning? I could have saved you so much time and money. Like I, we didn't need to be here. But then she says the real estate agent told me it was done so long ago that not to tell you. <laughs> and I went okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. You've listened to him, but just okay. Anyway, oh, to that was remify, done like, what, ten years ago. I, Don't worry well, about it, it now. It, I know it was done a really long time ago, but at the same time, um, we, the property was over three million. I think it was like three point five million or something. Like this is not an, yeah, a um, this is substantial property. Yeah, it's it's not a graphic where you're going. At, you know, the price range was not something that you're going to have people that go. Mwah. It was just a you know a two thousand dollar deck. It's the whole. It's pretty much the whole house because yeah. they've just they stripped the cottage back to bare bones and then built on top of it. Yeah, and so then to remify that situation, the purchaser they didn't rescind. It didn't settle, obviously, on time, yeah. because what she then had to do was go and find uh, engineers, go and find surveyors. She had to get approval. Yeah and retrospectively get approval from engineers and surveyors and all trades that didn't do the work. So it was very costly. Mm. And then after she'd done that, I think it cost like $50,000 for the engineer's certificate alone. Wow. To do it. And then after she'd got the approval, then the purchaser requested a major discount of the price of the property and it ended up settling like six months later. Okay. Um, so the moral of that story is vendors have disclosure and when we issue emails to clients, we do say that. We say you, know, you have an obligation to disclose what you know about this property Yeah. and we have the form that you fill out and, and if you disclose what you know, then we can help you, we can protect you, we can save you all of that yeah. stress, all of that headache, all of that money, we would have just been three lines in the contract. That's the most ironic thing about the whole thing. It would have just been three little lines in the contract to say it is what it is and it just would have saved this and, whole situation. Yes, and they, um, they either accept it as is or they move on and okay, buy something well, else. Yeah, That's right. Yeah, And it's that's the biggest takeaway. That's my, That was my really, you know, when I, whenever I talk about vendor disclosure to clients, I always go back to that, that case and I always say, like, this is our experience. This is what happened. Please tell me. Now, you've had, you have the odd, like, unapproved granny flat. Um, we also had a situation where a similar thing had occurred, but the records from council were destroyed. Um, right. Other, anyone in the industry would know certain councils that that has happened to. So it's, it's difficult to then go back and track. So we mm. had one where um, there were two dwellings on the property, but council say that only one dwelling was approved, the other one wasn't. And when our clients were purchasing the property, he's like, well, this must be the main house. I'm like, mm, no, we cannot assume that. Can't yeah. assume which one is right. It could be this older, older dwelling down the back of the ha- down the back of the property might have been the original one. Yeah. You can't assume that it was just the front one. They might have just built that. So you have those tricky type of situations to mm. navigate through too. But you write the right purchaser finds them and those type of properties aren't for everybody. No. Well, talking about purchases, um, we have a lot of property investors and, and people in the industry who are helping property investors like buyers agents. Um, what what when, when an investor is out there looking at a property, um, yeah, besides coming to a, a licensed conveyancer like you to get advice about the contract, what can they do in the first instance? And I guess this would this would be um, uh, this would apply to anyone buying a property. Um, but if there's anything specific for property investors, what they should what, what should they be looking out for first, or what questions should they be asking, or what should they be looking in the contract if they were looking at it themselves? Um, to, to maybe save some of that time, same, save some of those issues? Absolutely great. That's a great question. And, of course, if you have a buyer's agent, they're going to be doing a lot of this kind of legwork for you. So that's, yeah. that's also good. But if you, if you, there's no buyer's agent, you've picked your property. But some buyer's agents will 
you know, might need to know what to what to ask as well. Yes. Okay. For going to the contract. Okay. So first of all, I'm going to deal with the the first one where what can you do when you're at the property? Yeah. Check all the inclusions. Okay, flick the lights. Use the range hood. Um, if you can run the dishwasher, run the dishwasher. Uh, check the air conditioning works. Flush the toilets. Run the tap. See if there's any leaks. Um, I, you know, that might feel awkward to do going through the property, but at the end of the day, when that's the biggest thing when we get to settlements, um, it's, it's usually at that final inspection that maybe that's done and yeah. you find things and it's like, okay, what can we do about it? And it's like, oh, well, it kind of is being sold in its present condition and state of repair. So really yeah, sorry. It's like, oh, that's dishwasher. Like yeah, it used to work, um, but we haven't had it plugged in for years. Yeah, that time. Yeah. Of, yeah. And it's often like the ducted air conditioning. That's one of the biggest ones. And for um, for for one thing, it's it's such a strange little thing. But the range hood light, yeah, they always blow. And it's just yeah. it's it, it it I can almost predict when a client says, "Oh, it doesn't really matter," but and I, and I almost say the range hood light doesn't work. It's almost a thing. Like it just happens. Um, so that's like I, I better delay settlements. But it's just always a little no. thing. Like why does that always happen? Um, but yeah, test everything. Now in the contract, I guess what you're looking out for are unilateral uh, conditions. So conditions that give the the vendor a right to do something without consideration for the purchaser. Okay. Um, and they're often the ones that you know we look at and we question. Okay. The other the other ones are any disclosures. What would, what would be an example of that? An example of that would be that the vendor can change the settlement date. Um, make it, or the vendor can rescind if they haven't sold another, if they haven't purchased another property or the vendor can right. change the settlement date if they um, push it out more or they can. And those things aren't usually standard in a contract. They're they? not standard. No. And no. That, that's why you look out for them. That's why it's one right, thing okay. that you can do yourself. Because they're So you have your standard conditions and then you have special conditions. Yeah. The special conditions usually form a lot of the same tone throughout all, all firms. And yep. It's going to be this one, this one, this one. We look through them. So that's why anything like that does stand out. You're like, oh, that's that's not normal. Um, the other one is a disclosure. So if they have actually disclosed that something is not approved yeah. or they've disclosed that they didn't have home warranty insurance, yeah. okay, they're, they're good to know that they're doing their disclosure and yeah. that's something to look out for. And um, there was one other one. The release of deposit clause. Oh, yes. Probably the, it's the most of, famous one. It's yeah. the most famous one. It's probably the most bane of like all real estate agents are like, ah, this clause. <laughs> so it, we everyone put it, asks like, and everyone asks to ta have it taken out. To have it taken out. I don't know. Yeah. So, and I think it's, 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 it is an industry thing. So it depends on whether a firm will tailor their contracts to each client. So there are a lot of mm. solicitors that like, bang, 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 just get them out, get them out. And then they don't get instructions from their clients and their special conditions are supposed to cover everything. And it will have a lot of special conditions that do not apply to the property, like strata ones, and it's not a strata property. And yeah. and you're like, oh, God, this is like. Well, with, with the release of deposit, it maybe uh, uh, I might be able to help clarify because um, I, I, I've had differing answers from, from time to time from uh, different solicitors and conveyances. Okay. Can the deposit be released for absolutely any purpose or is it only for the purpose of the uh, vendor being able to uh, to be able to buy another property? That is, that has everything to do with the wording of the clause. Right, okay. So some of them do say that directly to the vendor. That's it. And some of them do say for the purposes of purchasing another property must be held in a trust account. Oh, obviously, those ones are a little bit more. We don't like either of them, but if we had to dance with the devil on one, it's going to be that one yeah. rather than the one where you just give it to the vendor and they go do it or they go have a holiday with it. Yeah. Um, we're going to like that. Yeah, we're going to like the one that's in a trust account over over the other one. Okay. All right. So, so it can be released for absolutely any reason. 
but uh, but there can be restrictions put on it as well. Absolutely. Okay, and then it's cool. a, it's whatever is agreed to. So a purchaser comes along, we come along, and we say delete that clause. Right. Okay. And we're not um, comfortable. all right. Well, that that clears that up. And um, a, a, anything else that a purchaser or a buyer's agent should look out uh, for when they're looking at um, buying a, a, a buying a property. Settlement dates. Yeah. Are is another one that can yeah. um, get tricky if yeah. you've got a vendor that maybe wants a three month settlement date because they've got to find somewhere else, but you've got a yeah. purchaser who has to be out of their rental in four weeks. Yeah. Uh, that could get and tricky. And what about That's what about buying um, buying under auction conditions versus um, private treaty? You know, a lot of people get put off by having to attend an auction and bid at auction. They don't just they just don't like it. Some people even refuse. It's like auction, no, not interested. Absolutely. Um, I find that too. Because yeah. of the I think that's because of the money that you have to spend go on on the property. Because I at an auction, if you are the most like if you are the successful bidder, the moment that hammer comes down, you have to buy that property. Yeah. So you have to be in a position to exchange unconditionally. Yeah. How do you get into that position? You have to have had the contract read over. You have to have your property or your searches that you want to do on the property. You have to have done your due diligence on that property. Um, you have to have your finance for that property. So there is a lot of time and money that is spent on that property for a risk of not getting it. And I think that's the purchaser's biggest issue with auctions. Yep. And why a lot of people would be like, no, it's going to auction. I'm not interested in it. Okay. And what happens when uh, you get the phone call and say, hey, Judy, I was taking my dog for a walk on the weekend and I walked past this auction and I um, ended up buying it. Um, it's, um, yeah, I luckily have my checkbook with me. Um, it's, um, if if there's issues with the contract and you, you're seeing it for the first time and they've already exchanged on it, Un unconditionally under auction conditions, is there really much that can be done at that stage to change anything? <laughs> um, again, this would all comes down to maybe, maybe not. Generally speaking, I would say no. It is that would be really risky. Um, yeah. I would say that kind of wow, congratulations, this is fantastic. Yeah, and I wouldn't panic until I saw the contract, right? Um, because a lot of the um, a lot of the terms really only kick in if the client is in breach of the right. contract. Okay, so there's a you know all the penalty clauses and things they kick in if they fall into breach. So depending on what the contract said, it might say that there was you know, unapproved works, but the client may know about that because the agent may have told them already. Yeah, if it's in the contract. So it would only, yeah, it, it, and then it would come down to, okay, what does this property look like? Is there an easement that runs through the middle of it? Is there some sort of restriction on the title that's going to, you know, our client might want to knock down rebuild. The restriction prohibits them from doing that. And I guess that comes down to the client, right? So if the client did want to do a knock down rebuild, they're probably not going to rock up at an auction and just buy without looking at the contract. Yeah. So it's, so whilst it, it's, absolutely not an ideal situation to do and I would not be recommending it to anybody. I have had them. I've had the call on Monday where it's like, do you purchase this property at auction? Can you please take it from here? Yep, sure, no problems. Oh, well. Absolutely. So, I can so they just need to live with the decision that they've made. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And then we just kind of like dance around in the chaos if it comes up and like, you know, yeah. <laughs> figure out what, what we about can and can't do here. And then there's the opposite situation where people are um, exchanging under a private treaty with a cooling off period. And a, a lot of, uh, from my experience, a lot of buyers don't fully understand the cooling off period process. Um, it's a lot of them think um, or are unaware that it's only for their purposes, the cooling off period, not for the vendor. Um, and, um, and also, um, what's the benefit to them of of getting an exchange contract under cooling off period, and um, and and also the, the the risks in terms of losing their their deposit? Can you sort of explain that process? 
Yes, so a cooling off period is under the contract for five days, five business days. That's the standard. Unless you're purchasing an off the plan, then you get 10 business days. Okay, so the benefit to a purchaser is you have the time to do your due diligence, knowing that that property isn't going anywhere. They can't sell it to anybody else. Yeah. And that gives you time to breathe, I guess. So where an auction, there is no time to breathe and there is a lot of anxiety over whether I'm going to get this, are we going to get this? Um, under private treaty, I'm particularly under a cooling off period, you lock it down and then you pay your 0.25%, whatever the purchase price is, to lock that in and get that time. Yeah. And then during that time, it is only for the purchaser. And it's for the purchaser so they can do their due diligence. Now, what was really interesting is it was introduced because there was a time where there was no cooling off period. And um, real estate agents would exchange contracts. Yeah. And purchasers wouldn't know. They might not have had their legal advice and they wouldn't really understand that, um, that that's what they're doing. And that happens now sometimes, particularly with um, more so now with uh, electronic signing. Yeah. Sometimes you get links and clients are signing away with these links and they don't realize they're actually signing the contract. So back in the paper before electronic signing, you would see the contract. And so yep. clients would be more like, oh, hang on. I didn't, I didn't realize this is what I was doing today. And we would get a call before that happened. Like, oh, I, yeah. I, this is what they want me to sign. But now, so you, you're not getting that paper thing. So it's not, a, it doesn't seem like it's a real thing that's in front of you and they're clicking and signing away. So they may not understand that they've entered into a contract. Yeah. And so they had to introduce something, the cooling off period, because yes. what was happening was people were like, oh, I didn't want to go ahead with that or I didn't know that's what I was doing. And there was obviously a lot of confusion and court cases and things that were um, going wrong. So they had to introduce something. And that's where the cooling off period came from. Um, where nowadays what we use it a little bit more um, – Purchases have adapted. They've used a bit more strategically to do this due diligence side of things. Yeah, spend yeah. that money knowing that you're the only person that can walk away at the end of the day. Yes. And the cooling off period, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it only starts once they've actually paid that 0.25% deposit and the vendor has signed the contract as well so that the, the contract can be dated, correct? Dated. It starts yes. at the contract date. So we and have situations. Yeah. So here, here are some fun, fun little situations that have come up. Okay. We have had situations where both parties have signed the contracts and the deposit has been paid. The contract was never dated. The contract is not on foot. For whatever real, whatever, whatever reason, the real estate agent has thought that that has happened. It has not happened. Contracts were issued as if the exchange had occurred. But when you looked at the front page, there was no date. Therefore, nothing has happened. Right. Just everyone has signed and has been paid. Until it's dated, there is yep. there is no contract. Okay. Um, then there was a situation where we had two, we had signatures and a date, but no 0.25%, no consideration. Yeah. There has to be consideration. So that 0.25% has to have been paid for the contract to be on foot. So, yep. therefore, there was no contract, yep. even though it was dated, but the deposit hadn't been paid. Mm. And the other side accepted that, okay, there's been no consideration paid, therefore, no contract. And regardless of both parties signing and there being a date, nothing had happened. There was no contract. Okay. So, uh, if the purchaser wanted to get out of it and save their um, 0.25%, um, they could easily do that. They did that, yeah. Yeah, Okay. But in, but in short, the benefit to a buyer who's especially an investor who might be looking at several properties and they're wanting to get a particular property at a, at a, at a good price, um, if they're able to negotiate, get the negotiations done and then do all of the hard work after the fact of getting finance and pest and building and all of that, all of those things that take time, then putting it into a cooling off period is, is something that they can um used to their advantage yeah absolutely yes okay cool yeah we it, do it's... say i do say that let me read over the contract first yeah because if you want to change some conditions in a contract 
particularly that release a deposit clause. Yeah. It can be done during the cooling off period. It, it absolutely can, but by agreement from the vendor. Yeah. Just like it can previous, like prior to the contract being entered into. But obviously prior to the contract being entered into, if you're, the purchaser would have more power in their position. Sure. Because they haven't entered in yet and they could easily walk away and go find another property of somebody who might actually agree to release that, to delete mm -hmm. that course. Because if, if they choose to walk away after the fact, then they will lose their 0.25% deposit. That's right. And the vendor, yep. the vendor gets the pockets that. And so there's more... Uh, the vendor's like, okay, well, no, we need that. And if you don't like that, you can walk. The vendor has the power of yeah. position, yeah. power of negotiation. So, yeah, yeah that's why I said, okay. let, let me have a read over it. Yeah. We'll go through it. If we have to change anything, that's when I ask. Yeah. And we don't hold anything up. We try not to hold anything up by saying, look, we'll send a quick email. I don't do my full written one. Just yeah. a quick email to the other side. Bang, bang, bang. Can you, can you get change the contract in this way? They reply back. We exchange on the same day. Cool. All right. So that's the quick, uh, that's, that can be the, uh, something done quickly, but things like pest and building reports and getting finance sorted, that can take a much, that can take days or, or weeks in some, some cases with some banks these days. So mm -hmm. it's, um, uh, okay, well, that's, that's very good. Uh, lots of helpful information for, for buyers out there. Some interesting stories about, uh, uh, sellers who should disclose everything. Um, um, Judy, it was great having you on the uh, on the podcast today. Lots of great information. Uh, we've been talking about it for a while, so um, good to have you on. Um, contract conveyancing, uh, if anyone needed to talk to you, uh, ask any questions, they can um, look you up. Is that the best way to do it, contract conveyancing? Absolutely. Uh, we're on all the socials, LinkedIn. You can email me, Judy, at contractconveyancing.com.au or call, yeah, absolutely reach out. Love to have a chat. All right, fantastic, fantastic. And, and of course, if anyone wants an introduction uh, personally, feel free to reach out to myself and uh, I'll do an email intro to um, Judy as well. So thank you, Judy. We'll um, see you again uh, shortly, I'm sure. And um, thank you to everyone for listening. Keep a, a, a listen out and an eye out for the next uh, podcast episode. Thanks.